with Freetronics and also automating his house with crazy devices with Superhouse. Yes. Please take away, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks Julian. <laughs> so, hello, Hobart. So, <laughs> hey, up the back. So this is the, um, <clears throat> the part of the conference where I make a fool of myself by pretending I know more than I do about software, hardware, networking, security, and radios, so that I can have five groups yelling at me all at the same time. <laughs> but before we get into that, I just want to dispel a myth. I've heard this really ugly rumor going around, and it goes something like this. This is obviously a damned lie. <laughs> I mean, I have great respect for uh, him, but oh, I just can't get into this. So we need to do something about it. So let's take a little bit of a tour back through history. We're going to have a story that starts, like many good stories, in 1947. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, where an event took place, and it was the International Telecommunications Confer Conference of the International Telecommunication Union. Not at all a mouthful. So what they were discussing was spectrum allocation. This was towards the end of the Second World War, and there needed to be some standardization on frequencies that were used around the world for different purposes. So they came up with a map. And this is the different parts of the radio spectrum with different uses applied to it. Now, this is not the 1947 version. This is a more up-to-date US version. But it shows you the general principle of what they were working on. They were looking at the range of frequencies and what could be used in each one. The reason this is important is that if you have multiple devices that are trying to communicate at the same frequency, then you get interference and nobody's happy. So there needs to be some agreement as to what will be used in different parts of the spectrum. So one of the delegates, the American, dele American delegate to this group, was pushing very hard for allocation of a specific frequency for use for unlicensed purposes. So what they came up with was a series of sections within the spectrum uh, that were called the ISM band for industrial, scientific, and medical. Now for most parts of the radio spectrum, if you want to build something that sends a signal, you need to have it tested, you need to have it licensed, you need to make sure that it doesn't interfere with anybody else. But the ISM bands are set aside so that they are specific parts of the, uh, the spectrum that can be used for different purposes without requiring a license. There are certain restrictions that are placed on them, uh, but the general idea is that this is a little bit of a playground where people can do different things. So in the, uh, the spectrum map that they came up with, they allocated a number of these bands for ISM purposes. Now, the American delegate had a particular interest in making sure that there was an ISM band around 2.45 um, mega, uh, gigahertz, and pushed it really hard, and they eventually agreed that, yes, this was going to be part of it. Now, the reason they were so interested in 2.45 gigahertz is that there is a certain big American industrial corporation called Raytheon, who had been making approximately a bajillion dollars a year making magnetrons for radar units during World War II. World War II was wrapping up. They wanted to keep selling magnetrons. They needed something to use them for. And radar generally operated at 2.45 gigahertz. So they came up with the microwave oven. So the original microwave oven was called the radar range. It was actually a radar magnetron inside a box. And the idea was that this was going to be used on ships and aeroplanes that would travel internationally, and they wanted to make sure that Raytheon could keep manufacturing their magnetrons and make lots of money, and these units could be used in different countries all around the world. But we're not really interested... Oh, so if you wonder why um, your Wi-Fi operates at 2.45 gigahertz, this is basically the reason. It's because that part of the spectrum was set aside for unlicensed use. So later, when other devices were created, they were put within those unlicensed bands so that people like you and I can use them without going out and getting amateur radio licenses. The particular part of the spectrum we're interested in today, and this is going to be our playground, is around 433.92 megahertz. 
And this is an incredibly common band for low power, short range radio communications in the ISM range. So there are a lot of devices that use this. Now my particular interest in this began in early 2009. I was working on a project to take data from building management systems, uh, log it over time, and then generalize, generalize, uh, sorry, do visualizations of the data. And what we wanted to do was take data from environmental sensors, things like weather, and from power sensors and be able to correlate it. So we wanted to see, for example, if there were variations in the weather, suddenly these buildings use more power because they're using aircon or whatever it happened to be. But we didn't have a source of building management system data. And we wanted to have some data coming in that our developers could use and have something real that was coming in that they could work with. So what we did was um, get hold of a Clipsal um, centimeter power monitoring device. So these have a sensor that clips over the active line of a, a power circuit and there is a little transmitter that they plug into. And then there is a matching receiver. So the receiver just sits on your desk or, or in your kitchen or wherever and you can see the instantaneous power consumption. You can see averages over time, all of that sort of thing. And the way these work is that the transmitter sends data periodically to this little receiver that sits on your desk and it does it at 433.92 megahertz. So we had a source of power data. I also went out and got a Lacrosse weather station, which does basically the same thing. It has a receiver that sits on your desk, sends data. So now on my desk I had these two receivers and I could see how much power was being used in different parts of the building and I could see the weather data coming in. But we needed to be able to store this and acquire it because these particular devices are only designed to be standalone. It's just a sensor and a display, and that's it. And they just blindly talk to each other and don't assume anybody else is going to interact with them. We needed a way to listen in on the signal that was being sent from the sensor. So the solution was this little module. It's a little circuit board that you can get on eBay for in the order of three, four, five dollars. It's not particularly expensive. And it's a pre-tuned 433 megahertz receiver module. They're incredibly simple to use. Basically, you stick an antenna on it, connect ground and five volts, and then you get a data stream coming out the other end. So this gives you the ability to listen in at a logic level to, the, uh, to whatever's going on around you. So all of these devices that are around you all the time operating, sending data at 433 megahertz, you can tune them in using one of these little modules. So I was working on this with my friend Mark Alexander, and uh, we worked out a little circuit, how we were going to connect it up with a status display. We jammed it on a prototyping shield and connected it to an Arduino. And so we had all of the electronics we needed to receive the signals that were flying around us randomly. So that thing up on the right is an antenna. It's just a biro with a bit of wire wrapped around it and some tape. So this was where my knowledge totally hit a brick wall. At this point, I didn't know what else to do from here. But luckily, Mark is an expert on this sort of thing. So he took it all away and um, did something and wrote some code. And he inserted the magic in the Arduino that allowed it to decode these signals. And so the rest of this talk is basically me um, talking about how I stumbled around like a drunk man in the dark trying to figure out how he jammed the magic in there so that I could try to do something similar with other devices. And I am by no means an expert in this. I've been trying to figure this out as I go, but I've picked up a few little principles along the way that have helped me out, so uh, maybe they'll help you out as well. So the first thing is, and this is something that I always forget, search for existing resources. A lot of people are interested in this, and if you look around, you'll find that a lot of people have had a go at decoding signals that are out there. So there was a particular device I was looking for just recently, and I did a search for you know, decode signal from this tank depth sensor, and I found this uh, thread on the Arduino forum, and someone had been interested in this, 
and they had actually traced down the manufacturer in China, found the original uh, white label factory, and said, what's your communications protocol? And they sent him a spreadsheet, which is really, really cool. I mean, you, you can't always get that lucky, but in this case, he did. So the spreadsheet broke down the bits of data that are sent by the device. So it shows the order of the bits, what they use them for, a bit of an explanation. Um, so this gives you a huge amount of information that can get started. So you're not necessarily working totally in the dark. You can have something to get started with. And if you look down at the bottom of that spreadsheet, they even have an explanation for their modulation scheme. So you can see that they have pul a pulse train which has 480 microseconds high and then 480 microseconds low for a logic zero, and a logic one is the same thing except that it's one microsecond in length on the low. So when you're looking at the raw train of pulses coming from one of these weather stations, we now know what timing to look for to try to convert that from just a raw waveform to a, um, a series of zeros and ones. And at that point, we can start to do something with it. So one of the things that I've found frustrating is that there really isn't any single central place that you can go to for resources about this. I've found just odds and ends all over the place. So in preparing for this talk, I actually just created a page, um, and I'm going to start populating this. Anything I find that I come across, I'm going to add to this page so that if you're interested in weather stations, and you can go along there and see how it's been decoded or power monitoring or whatever. Um, I know of quite a few more that I haven't added to this yet, but if anybody's interested in, uh, in helping with this, that would be really cool. So it's just at superhouse.tv slash RF dash protocols. So the second principle or stage is to capture an example of the original signal. So if you have a device which is sending data and you want to listen in on it, you need to just capture it exactly as it is. Don't bother trying to interpret it or understand it. You just want to make a recording of it and see what it is. And there are a few different ways you can do that. Um, you can use a radio receiver. This is a little handheld transceiver, you know, commonly used by amateur radio operators. And um, that allows you to tune in on the correct frequency. And then you can just literally listen to the data packets. And you can record them. So actually, let's do that. Frequency mode. So this is now tuned into 433.920 megahertz. And here I have a button from a home automation system. The idea with this is that you set the addresses on them. This gets attached to the wall. And then you have devices like uh, this plug that goes into a PowerPoint. And there are also permanently installed modules that you can, do, that you can wire into, the, in, say, into your ceiling so you can control lights directly off this. So if we listen to this now and do a transmission, you can hear the data packets. It's as easy as that. So we can just record that raw audio signal into, say, a web file. And then we have, it's, it's like recording off a modem, basically. So we then have a, a file that we can look at to try to get the waveform of what those packets look like. And the way you can do that is using uh, programs like Sonic Visualizer, which is GPL. So this runs on Linux and Mac and Windows as well. And you can feed a, a web file into it and see the marks and spaces. So you can see the shape of the waveform that's coming through. And this allows you to start to decode. So in the example we looked at earlier of the tank depth sensor, where we know the duration of the highs and lows on the pulses, you could sit here and look at this and use a pencil and paper and start to decode it, which is exactly what I do. So in fact, I've got my notebook here somewhere, which has got a whole lot of scribblings in it. So let's have a look at, at that. I've got that live right here. So this is, oh, it's not mirrored. No, now you can see it. OK. So this is uh, Sonic Visualizer. And it's loaded a WAV file, which was recorded off the tank depth sensor. So we can scroll across. You can see there's a packet of data there. Then there's a 
break and then there's another packet of data. And this was recorded just straight off a receiver, listening in on the signal. But by zooming in, we can see the timing on these pulses and then we can start to decode it. So that's a, um, a fairly crude way of doing it, but it is a very cheap way of doing it. You don't necessarily need something like a receiver like this. You can use uh, one of those uh, digital TV receiver dongles. They're pretty cheap. You can get little software-defined radio boards that you can use as a receiver. As long as you can get it a, um, an audio output, save it as a web file, you can then start analyzing it. So the next step beyond that is to use something like an oscilloscope. And what I've done here is coupled up an oscilloscope with one of those receiver modules. So that's the same receiver module that we saw at the start that gives us the data output. And you can see it down there on, on the yellow shield. And then by, uh, so that's running now. So then by pressing the transmitter, and then hitting stop on the storage oscilloscope, we've now got a recording of the waveform over that point in time. We can zoom in on it, and then you can, once again, measure the, the timing on the waveform, and you can zoom right in and see what's going on. So you can then just scroll across, sit there once again with a notepad, and say, OK, it was 480 microseconds high and 700 microseconds low. And by doing that, you can come up with a timing pattern. And at this point, we still don't even know what that bitstream represents. All we know is that that is the data that was sent by the device. But it still gets us a long way there. So another tool you can use is a logic analyzer. Um, normally, logic analyzers are quite big and expensive, and they look a bit like that oscilloscope. So it's a large device with a screen on it. But it's very common now to get USB logic analyzers. They're tiny little devices, you plug it into your computer, and it basically just acts as a capture front end, and then the software does all the work. So this is one from um, Stately A, which is called uh, Logic. So that's an eight channel example of a logic analyzer. And the difference between a logic analyzer and a, an oscilloscope is you can think of an oscilloscope as being an analog measurement. So it's looking at the shape of the waveform. What a logic analyzer does is it doesn't really care whether the waveform like how high it's going or anything like that. It's just looking at the, the logic. Is it on or off? So it gives you a very binary sort of output, whereas an oscilloscope gives you more of a, an analog. It gives you the shape of it. So an oscilloscope is great if you're looking at noise and modulation and those sorts of things. A logic analyzer is good if you've got a bit stream and you want to be able to measure all the timings and then convert it into data. So coupled with the little adapter dongle, and there's one just right here, um, is the software. So in a similar way to what you saw on the oscilloscope, you see the shape of the waveform, and then we can zoom in on it. So once you've got a captured version of the waveform, we see the timing, we know what it's doing, the next principle is to reproduce uh, the signal yourself. So you still don't even need to understand what it is. Now, this is one of the traps that I fell into very early was I thought that once I had received the signal, I needed to start decoding it. Now, the problem with that is that a lot of these devices will only transmit periodically. Like if you've got a sensor, like a tank depth sensor, it might only transmit every 15 minutes. Or a power monitor might transmit every three minutes. So if you are sitting there trying to write some software that decodes that bitstream, and you can't produce the bitstream on demand, it's going to drive you insane. I've, I just about killed myself trying to decode that tank depth sensor. And then I realized, no, what I should be doing is being able to replay that raw waveform anytime I wanted so that I didn't have to be just sitting there going, come on, come on, come on, is it going to transmit yet? So I was talking about the notebook earlier. <laughs> this is literally what I did. So I took the... Uh, the timings off that waveform and wrote it all down. And then uh, you can convert that very simply into a program which will drive a transmitter or even just a, a digital data line to reproduce that same waveform. And then you've got something that you can produce on demand and you can then work on your decoder to try to interoperate with it. 
So that particular um, waveform is the one from this little home automation controller. So it's a bit hard to see in the lighting here, but if I hit that, it's turning this receiver on and off. So I did a very simple little sketch. Now this, you're not necessarily expected to read all of that. The reason I put it all on the screen was just to show how little there is of it. There are no includes there. That is the entire thing compiled to run on an Arduino. And it's got some timing in the send message that has a few delays in it. It's basically toggling a data pin with a few delays measured in microseconds. And then it iterates um, 23 times over a pulse. It just repeats for the rest of the message that's sent by this device. So that entire sketch will recreate the signal that is transmitted by that little home automation device. So uh, let's try it. If I've got one here somewhere. That was one of the things I didn't get out. So what I have here is a little shield which has both a transmitter and a receiver module on it. So what I can do with this is listen in on transmissions, but I can also reproduce them and send them. So I'll just pull these out. So if I power up this little board, it should transmit that signal. Nope, doesn't seem to be working. Oh well. <laughs> I haven't done a proper talk unless I've had a, at least one demo fail, so that's out of the way. So the next thing is to develop a decoder for the signal. What is that? <laughs> yeah, that could be a problem. OK, so while you're looking at that, hey! <laughs> It was transmitting something. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so what I'm going to do here is have a look at this raw waveform. OK, so what's on the screen now is what I have right here. So I have the receiver connected up, and the logic analyzer is connected here. So what we can do is switch over to logic. start running. So this is now waiting for a signal to be received. So if I transmit on here, it 
this has got to be the most full of fail demo ever. Okay, I'll just show you the result anyway. So, <laughs> so once you've got the pulses coming into your device, what you need to do is a whole lot of messing around with timing. So the important thing is to measure the duration of the pulses and then apply some logic to figure out where the ones and zeros start. So on an Arduino, the way to do that, or on any microcontroller, is to use an interrupt and the critical thing for an AVR is that it has a pin called the ICP, which is the input capture pin, that allows it to do extremely accurate timing. So if you connect to that particular, and I'm not even transmitting, I don't think that's me. <laughs> so if you connect to uh, pin eight, you can do very accurate timing. You can set an interrupt that will return on a transition, so on a low to high transition or a high to low transition. And this particular code was from, um, from a program that was developed by Angus Grattan for reading the protocol from a blind controller, so for electric blinds. And what it does is set up all of the, um, the interrupts. So you also need to make sure that the prescaler is set correctly. What is going on there? One of the traps on the, um, the AVR is that the ICP doesn't seem to like to work unless you have the prescaler set to divide by eight. So that makes it run at two megahertz because typically on an Arduino it runs at 16 megahertz. So make sure that you set the, uh, the prescaler to divide by eight. So you can then have a, uh, an interrupt that will return the duration of the last pulse. So once you've got pulses being recorded, you need some kind of a state machine. So that if you, because what you're gonna be seeing is a whole lot of noise. The signal is gonna be jittering all over the place normally, exactly like this. <laughs> <laughs> except, <laughs> except when there is a legitimate signal coming in. So if you just look at the raw output from the receiver, it's going to have pulses of different durations. It's going to be all over the place. So what you need to know is, are you looking at noise or are you looking at valid bits? And the way to do that is to use a state machine that allows you to, uh, to drop out of a receiving state if you see noise. So you set up a basic state machine. We really only need two states. So we're either looking at noise or we're capturing data. Yep, thank you. So then what we do, <laughs> so then we implement a filter which looks at the duration of the pulse. So what you'll find is that the duration will be all over the place while there's noise, but it will become very regular while you're picking up a legitimate signal. And by having a filter, which is basically a, a low threshold and a light, low, high threshold for the duration, if you see anything that's outside of that threshold, then we know that we're not seeing a valid signal and we drop back into the noise state. And then by tuning those thresholds, you can adjust how much sensitivity you have. So at the expense of increasing sensitivity, you might get more noise, or you can um, squelch out more noise by narrowing that, buff uh, narrowing that window right down. So once you've passed through the time filter, and you know that you haven't dropped it out of the, um, the capturing state and you know you're not in the noise state, the next thing is you need to um, record whether this is a zero or a one. And as we saw earlier with that um, tank depth sensor, it had different durations of the low part of the pulse, but that's only one possible way it could be done. That is a fairly common sort of encoding scheme, but in this little part of the code, there are actually probably another couple of dozen lines that go in there. Those lines are totally dependent on the modulation scheme that's being used by this transmitter. So in the example of the tank depth sensor, or in the, the example of the, um, the blind controller, which, is this, which this is from, 
it looks at the duration of the pulses and then decides if it's got a zero or a one and it adds them to a buffer. And then over time, as you get this pulse train coming in, it builds up the buffer until you end up with an entire packet. So the result is a whole series of zeros and ones. But at this point, we still don't know what it means. The important thing is that there are really three different parts of a typical packet sent by a radio device like this. The first is the preamble. And that's because when it starts transmitting, there's going to be noise. So it needs basically some throwaway bits at the start where it just pulses so that the receiver can start to synchronize. And also um, so that you can, uh, you can match onto the, the timing. So the preamble doesn't usually mean anything other than, hey, I'm starting transmission soon. Then there is the actual message itself. So this is the bit we care about in terms of decoding it and figuring out what data is going on in there. And then it's trailed by the checksum. So in this example, the checksum is just a simple sum of all the previous bytes with the extra bits thrown away. So if you've got an error introduced somewhere in here, then the checksum won't match. And what happens on the receiver is you just add up all of those bytes, throw away the extra, extra bits, and if it's not the same thing, then you know it's a reject and you just ignore the whole packet. But that's a very simplistic way of doing it. What is more common is a method called parity byte XOR, which is a, um, a CRC type routine, uh, which is really good for detecting burst errors. So typically what happens with radio interference is that most of the packet will be fine, and then you might get multiple errors within one small part of it. And, and XOR is a really good way of doing that. So what that does is you take your entire message, break it down into words, and you do the XOR of each of those, and append it to the message. Now the magic part of this is that if you then XOR everything, including the bit at the end, you should get zero. So if you get that, you know it's all good. So most of this work that I've been showing so far has been done in the context of setting up um, transmitters and receivers to work with blinds. So this is a test rig uh, that's in my workshop at home. And there is a tubular motor inside the, uh, the blind itself. And it's got an RF receiver and this transmitter. And the idea is that you can just open and close your blinds, obviously, with the remote control. But uh, we wanted to be able to create our own controls for it. And we also wanted to be able to make our own motors that would operate with the existing controls. And that's where a lot of this reverse engineering came from. So in order to do that, I then made a board which incorporated pretty much everything that we've seen so far. So it's got the transmitter and receiver on it. It's also got the Arduino built into it. So the Arduino can do the, um, the decoding. And then underneath, you can see the Raspberry Pi 3. And they're jammed together with level translators so that the Raspberry Pi can talk serial to the Arduino. It can also tweak its reset line so that the Raspberry Pi can actually um, compile new firmware and then install it on the Arduino. So it can update its RF decoder without having to do anything directly. Um, I then stuck it in a box. And these are all the different parts that run on it. So what I do is use OpenHab running on the Raspberry Pi as like a central coordinator. That's what takes in um, external commands, maintains the state of everything. And I use an MQTT broker for messaging and the development tools as well so that it can do updates and push it to it. So the Arduino basically takes care of all of the radio communications and then just provides over the serial port data directly to the Raspberry Pi and it accepts commands from it. So the Raspberry Pi itself can then serve up an app using the, the OpenHab app. And from there, I can see all of the different devices that it's managing. And as you can see, I can pull in temperature data from different things. So this is a combination of all sorts of different devices, some of which are intended to be used for home automation, but most of them aren't. And there are things that have been modified using the, some of the techniques that I've just shown you so that you can talk to them through this little device. So the brain itself acts as a bridge. It, it connects to my own network and it allows me to control things, but it also talks to all these different RF protocols so that other devices that were never intended to be connected to the internet 
can now have their data acquired and they don't even know about it, and they can also be controlled. So all of these different protocols can be implemented just within that Arduino so that it can talk to all these different devices. So what you may have noticed is that none of this required any authentication or any knowledge on the part of the device we were talking to that we were doing this. We are just eavesdropping on their signal, private conversations, and we're listening in. So what that means is that with a device like this or any of the tools that I've shown you, you can do all sorts of really fun things. <laughs> the thing is that we're surrounded by these sorts of devices all the time and we use them. Like it's very common to go down to you know, Bunnings and buy a remote control power strip with a button. You plug it in, you start controlling things around your house. You don't even think about it. But there is no provision whatsoever for preventing signal spoofing or eavesdropping or anything like that on any of these devices. So you can forgive that for, uh, for people that aren't really thinking about this from a, a threat point of view. I mean, if you are making something like a weather station and you're sending the data, you think, oh, what's the harm in that? What can go wrong? Well, there are all sorts of things that could be done. Now, I've just shown that you can uh, spoof these various signals. So we could do things like pretend to be your water tank and report that there is no water in it and therefore the irrigation system doesn't water the garden. There are all sorts of little things that we can do. But there's one industry that really should have thought this through and they have jumped on the convenience bandwagon way too hard. Any ideas who it is? Sorry? Pretty close. Yes, it is a security industry. And yes, this is a wireless motion detector. And I'll turn it on. Let's see, we'll turn on this receiver. Let's see if we can get anything. Frequency mode. Whoa, that was data packets. And that's a security system that we can eavesdrop on. And there is absolutely no, um, no protection built into that at all. There, it just will blindly send out its state. Anytime it's triggered, it'll send it out. So we can now sit outside someone's house and track their movement in the house without them knowing. We could potentially trigger their security system by just spoofing the signal. We could say, hey, that's, that motion detector is going off and it's not actually doing it. So I'll skip through a couple of things here. So I'm almost out of time, but just to how to avoid this. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this is something that network engineers will tell you all the time. Assume your network is always compromised. So <laughs> yeah, I had to make it just a little bit stronger. So what you really need to do is follow normal um, network security practices. Make sure you use encryption. Assume that someone is sitting there with a wiretap listening to everything and having the ability to inject packets. You need to be able to detect that. You need to be able to prevent them from spoofing packets. And you also need to be able to prevent them from, um, from jamming. Because I could just as effectively, without understanding any of these protocols, just sit there and blast out a signal that will override any receiver and prevent these things from working. So I'm being given the wind up, but basically, you really need to look for some of these existing solutions. And unfortunately, you can't implement these in 32-bit packets, which is what most of these devices use. It does incur overhead. So you need to have some kind of a balance between a system that is going to give you um, the security and non-repudiability and all of those sorts of things that you need, while not overloading and requiring you to use a full-on PC when all you want is little 8-bit microcontroller. And, um, that is another solution. So I have people all the time say to me, why don't you just go fully wireless with your home automation system? And uh, this is kind of why. So there was way too much more there that I couldn't demo, but I'll probably do some more demos down the front. So if anybody wants to come down and see this for real, I will take some time trying to get it all connected up properly and you can come and have a look. But thank you very much.
we have any questions? Mark. So garage door openers, uh, door locks, those also are RF. Uh, yes. Last I checked, they didn't seem to have much security in them at all, if anything. Have you looked into those? Yes. So in the, the thing is that technology marches on. So things like garage doors, obviously, if you can open someone's garage door, you can get physical access to their property most of the time. That's a really big problem. And people don't think about their garage doors as much as they think about, say, the front door on their house. But it's the same, it's the same thing. The remote controls that are typically used on garage doors usually operate 433 megahertz, sometimes 915 megahertz if they're for the US. But they don't have much more security than this. Some of them implement a rolling code authentication scheme or various other methods to prevent replay attacks so that they don't see the same signal twice in a row. Uh, but all of this is stuff that originated 20 years ago. And we, have, we can crack Wi-Fi by brute force now. That sort of thing is an insignificant barrier. So being able to sniff a signal from someone's um, garage door remote control and then um, override that is not particularly difficult with current technology. Just a quick question. Um, uh, when you mentioned you were decoding by hand using the numbers, I just wanted to suggest there's a talk by Michael Osman on YouTube and he suggests a really good basic Linux command line tools to automate exactly what you did there. And, uh, you made it really, really quick, but the question I do have for you is uh, why didn't you use software-defined radio as an approach such as the GNU radio framework and uh, a USRP transmitter receiver? I had to take all, all that hardware out of it. Oh, that's certainly another way to do it. I've got a couple of um, SDR boards at home. I, I built the SDR at the, uh, the amateur radio mini-con last year or the year before, whenever it was. Um, I was just showing one way to do it, but yeah, that's certainly a good way to do it. Now, Michael Osman, I think, has done a lot of work with radar, hasn't he? I think that's his specialty. Yeah, uh, my, yeah Michael did uh, work, but you might be thinking of Balance Zebra as well. He did some work with um, the, the same sort of stuff. And uh, also Silvio Cesare, who runs B-Sides in Canberra. Uh, myself and him did a bit of work on the rolling codes, and we found that the easiest way to um, defeat those was when you, you can actually purchase replacement remotes and there's always a synchronization method for new remotes to sync up with the, uh, the rolling code. So if you just look at the byte stream long enough, you'll find a, a known code in there uh, so the two can, can sync up. Anyway, enough yep. about that. I'll pass it on. Thanks. Anyone else? Where you have multiple devices in a house all running at the same frequency and maybe similar but maybe different protocols, how do you do device identification? Um, because they are similar but not identical. <laughs> um, if you have multiple devices which are actually identical, typically they will have some kind of an identification header. So a classic example is with the, um, the weather station, like the lacrosse weather station. Each time it starts up, it generates a random code, some identifier for itself, which I think is only, uh, might be 16 bits, might even only be eight bits, because the chance of collision with a nearby weather station is fairly low. What happens is that you power down the receiver, you start up the weather station, and then you power up the, trend, the receiver again, and whatever the next thing is, it's very much like that binding to a new key routine, the next weather station that it sees, it will read its code off the header and only listen from that point on to transmissions from that particular weather station. So it would be very easy, for example, to bring in another receiver or have multiple receivers power up a weather station and they would both bind to it. Um, so it's one of those things that's usually done just by obscurity. And if you do happen to get collisions because the number of bits in the identifier is very low, you just turn one of them off, turn it back on again, and you'll get a different identifier. Uh, we're now out of time. So just like to present on behalf of LCA. Appreciation. Can we give John a round of applause? Thank you.